So uh, we actually have a lot of audience participation in this talk today. So I know you didn't think you were coming to a workshop, but we're actually coming to, <laughs> you actually came to a workshop. We have light up balloons. We have the um, make your own GNSS take home guide. And if we're able to get through everything, then we do have a song at the end. So. <laughs> Okay, so my name is Christina Sear. Uh, I'm CEO of Detour and the Circle Phone, and here are my credentials. Um, just a little bit about the Circle Phone, because everybody goes, why? <laughs> and uh, the Circle Phone is basically an Android phone, uh, but it has a round display. Uh, and I say just, but we had to do a lot of uh, engineering, or I had to do a lot of engineering to make that work both on the hardware side and the software side as well. The display drivers and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it was solving the mobile phone monotony problem. You know, we've had the same uh, rectangular phone since 2007. And it's just for someone, people who want to try something different. Uh, there's actually a lot, a lot of science behind putting images in cropping them into a round shape it makes your Instagram look fantastic. It makes YouTube videos look amazing. Uh, also, if you're reading text, it uh, brings your focus to the center of the text, uh, so it helps you absorb that really quickly. Most of our um, most of our information that we absorb nowadays is pictorial based, and so this is a great medium for absorbing all the information that you have to take in. First question people ask is, what about my rectangular apps? What's, what's going to happen with those? So we actually use a little known feature of the Android build, and that's freeform mode. So it's more like a desktop, so you can shrink and grow uh, your application windows. You can even move them around your desktop to access the application uh, icons behind. It's really cool. So I put a ton of, because I'm an engineer and I couldn't stop, uh, I put a ton of really cool things in it. Um, so one of the cool things is that your selfie camera, normally on your phone, it's only eight megapixels, but on this phone, it's uh, 13 megapixels. Uh, so when I first designed it in 2018, that was a big deal. Um, of course, we have dual SIM because uh, most of the Android users are outside of the United States and they love uh, shopping for price shopping for different SIMs, one for data, one for voice. So having the dual SIM was really important. Um, we actually had a delay during COVID, imagine that, uh, with our launch. And so while I was pretty bored during that time, so I added uh, temperature sensors so you could tell your temperature before somebody else te tested it uh, for COVID reasons. It's right next to the selfie camera. Uh, I added NFC because we hadn't had it uh, up to that point. And um, back in 2018, we were still switching over to type C. And so uh, there's actually a switch on the side. You can use either micro B or USB type C. Um, but the only thing that people ever talk about is the dual audio jack. So in doing research for this phone, I talked to thousands, literally thousands of people about their mobile phone usage. Uh, both in person, um, mo actually mostly in person, and uh, millennials in particular were expressing a sense of sadness, especially in 2019, that everybody was so heads down in their phone, they weren't connecting to the person next to them. And I thought, gosh, wouldn't it be cool to, hey, I can put a second audio jack onto it, and you can share your music and videos with the person sitting right next to you. And I uh, thought that was really cool, and that's all anybody ever talks about. So, um, but uh, it's also interesting to know that we're actually the most eco-friendly smartphone on the planet. Our enclosure is made of biogradable materials. Um, like the Fairphone, we also included a uh, uh, screwdriver with the phone so you can repair your own um, display we send you an extra display you know because nobody has a lot of round displays so um, and you can change your battery all those kinds of things so it's user repairable um, we started small uh, I put together in 2014 I put together a ton of these are not my phones these are compet um, competitors but I put together a ton of hobby phones to prepare to see if I could actually put together a smartphone. 
so I spent 2014, 2015 putting together a lot of hobby phones and um, I couldn't buy the parts that I needed without becoming a corporation. So I became a corporation and I slapped together like a 2G phone just to get feedback from people to see what they wanted. They started asking to buy the 2G phone and I was like, wait, you want to wait, wait for the 4G? But actually that was really popular. So we did a Kickstarter, Susie. I said bad word in this room, sorry. We did a crowdfunding campaign and it was uh, huge, it was successful. We delivered all the units in 60 days. So it was really uh, a great way to start. Uh, I think that slide got moved. Um, and then I searched for a uh, round display and I searched for a 4G module uh, and in 2016, they just really weren't available. Um, but fortunately, I was able to test out a couple of different things, finally found what I needed. So in 2017, I uh, started making it. And then the module uh, that I was going to use, um, the OEM got in a fight with or Qualcomm, excuse me, and I couldn't get the module for two years. It was really devastating to me and it was really hard. Um, so during that time, uh, I taught other people how to build their own mobile phones uh, at Maker Fairs, Geek Girl Con, um, and a bunch of other venues as well. So um, I've taught over 300 people to make their own smartphone um, and I'm really proud of that. Um, but of course, all I was dreaming of was being on the cover of Wired magazine. So. Um, this is uh, an interesting picture because I actually, I was just so frustrated because I couldn't, uh, I had developed the schematics. I didn't have the module, so I couldn't make the phone and it was so frustrating. Uh, this is actually taken in my bathroom <laughs> with a wooden model of um, the uh, model that actually I was able to build the following year. So it was great. Um, and then we showed off um, the original model that you saw in the previous picture at CES 2020 to over a thousand people. We had our own booth. We were one of the most popular startup booths and got tons of people. Um, it was kind of like when we had the 2G phone at Mobile World Congress, we couldn't even take bathroom breaks. There were so many people trying to see it. Um, and uh, we got a lot of great press coverage. This is actually the um, latest uh, model. Uh, we got good coverage by CNET. Um, journalists from Japan really loved coming to see us. This is actually our second booth at C CES. So of course the pandemic hit. So we were at 2020, pandemic hit, they were, it was virtual. And then 2022, uh, this is me. Oh, and the reason that I actually put this added this uh, slide in, I love hair hacking. So this um, particular palette glows under black light, fluoresces mm -hmm. under black light. So uh, that's actually the only reason I added that slide. Um, we were uh, fortunate to be featured uh, on the cover of Plastics Engineering uh, last, uh, let's see, two Aprils ago uh, as the most eco-friendly smartphone on the planet because our plastic is made of biodegradable corn. Um, and so uh, that was really exciting. We even beat out the Fairphone, which um, I love them. Uh, they're also our competitor. So, mm -hmm. um, And this year we received the um, award um, from CES. So this is really meaningful to me as a woman to get this award. It's hard for me not to crack, break down about that. So thank you. <laughs> okay. So imagine that we have the dragon slide up again. <laughs> so what you really came for was GNSS. And um, what's been happening in the last year is that, well, a couple of things. In my personal life, um, we had a year-long delay uh, in our dual SIM connector, uh, and I was really bored. And this company came back to me. They had been asking for me to work for them two years. Let's see, they asked me in 2019. 
2020, something like that. And so then they asked me again last year and, and um, I wasn't excited about the project, but I was excited. Well, the product, the project was great and the team was phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. Um, and they asked me to build some low power GNSS solutions. So I built several and they're uh, some of the most low power uh, that we have today. So I was really fortunate. I even got to do a chip down solution. That was my first time to work with uh, kind of HDI boards. And I was, now I'm all about HDI. Um, but uh, after this talk, um, I'm just trying to give everybody a primer. So probably most of you know a lot about GNSS already, but some of you may not. So this is kind of the intro um, to catch everybody up to the same place. So. I hope the number one thing, if you don't remember anything else from this talk, if you can walk away from this talk and start calling it GNSS instead of GPS, I'll love you. I'll just, you'll have, you'll have my, my fandom. Um, okay, so, uh, and then you also want to be able to name GNSS from four different countries. Understand how SBAS helps GNSS. Can everybody pronounce GNSS? You know, the G is silent. It goes, unts, 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 unts. <laughs> and SBAS is SBAS, SBAS, right? Okay, so it'll be in the song later. Just, just <laughs> foreshadowing here. Um, and then you want to learn and leverage various GNSS frequencies, both new and old. There's a lot that's come on in the last two years. You want to know about that, and you want to leverage that and to create accurate and or low power tracking devices, depending on your use. So, oh, these are the prizes. Can you get the balls out, please? Thank you. Okay, could please, please someone name one thing that you can track with GNSS and you get a prize. Battleship. Car. Cars, excellent. Battleship, excellent. Cows, children. <laughs> Cows, children. Excellent. Yep. Okay. So, um, a dirty little secret. A lot of uh, companies came forth with uh, child tracking devices about, what was it, six years ago? I think there were three more. Hey, raise your hand if you actually responded. You get actually a prize. So, um, just keep your hand raised. So, um, this is actually my son, Cole Page. Can everybody give him a hand? Yeah. So, thank you. Um, so, uh, so dirty little secret about oh, six years ago, a bunch of companies came forward with child tracking devices this is before you could do like, find my, find my, uh, phone, find my person, find my people, life 360, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but, um, retailers would not sell it for liability reasons because if the child got lost and the tracking device did not work. Um, it was a huge issue. So instead, they remarketed it as pet tracking devices. So if you want to get a really good <laughs> kid tracking device, go ahead and just buy the pet tracking device, and that'll work pretty well. So um, yes, so not only do we track the things around us, but boats, planes, automobiles, and industrial uh, machinery like tractors and things like that uh, definitely use GNSS. That's why it's important. So how DNS works. So, oh, the name showed up before the dragon. Okay, so here's our dragon. And I named him Rover because in GNSS, uh, the targeted device that you're, that you're trying to measure if GNSS is working on is typically called a Rover. And so um, I really wanted to name him Henry, but we're gonna go with Grover today. Okay. And we're going to put the Dragon Tracker D-Track 100 on him. Includes maritime and aviation features. Up to 10 meter accuracy. It's a big dragon. It should be okay, right? So how GNS works is that you have four. You have to have at least four. Um, so you would think three because, you know, X, Y, Z, three. But it turns out you need four four uh, satellite readings to be able to get a, a targeted location. And then basically you uh, compare the time 
that the signal was sent, uh, and the satellite information will give you that to the time that it was received, and that's your clock, and then uh, measure the distance. So um, I'm still learning how to pronounce these, <laughs> but uh, I just stick with ephemeris. So it's the data that comes off of the satellite. So that's uh, the data that you want to store, uh, either on your device or send along. So um, the reasons um, that make this really important now, uh, and you'll learn more about this later in the talk, are multi-frequencies and multi-GNSS. Um, that's a huge mouthful. Don't worry about it. Just like, again, foreshadowing. Um, L5 became available in 2021 for GPS. This is really important. Um, Satellite-based satellite aug augmentation systems, uh, especially regional ones, highly improve uh, GNSS accuracy. You should keep these in mind if you go outside of the United States with your tracking device, um, particularly outside of the United States. Um, so, and a lot of GNSS modules have been released recently, not only uh, to address the L5 band that came online in 2021, but also uh, to address the newer satellite systems, and we'll get into those. So um, these are the four main uh, global navigation satellite systems. See, that's what the acronym stands for. We even spelled it out here. Um, so GPS, uh, GLONASS, and uh, this one's interesting too. Uh, there's lots of mispronunciations on the internet, and I'm probably going to mispronounce it here, but we're going to give it a try. So the way I re remember it is hey, yo. So be, do. Let's all try it. Be, do. Be, do. So um, they're trying to switch to the BDS acronym, but because everything's kind of hard-coded in be, do. So um, let's see if they'll succeed. But hopefully we'll switch to BDS, but... Um, like I said, everything's still uh, slow to change. And then Galileo uh, is the one for the European uh, satellites. Kind of late to the game due to political reasons. Um, and they just went live in 2016. So um, there's also two more that you'll need to know about. And we'll go over those in the workshops. Um, the quasi Zenith satellite system, the QZSS. Uh, for the Japan. It's also the Asian Pacific region. Um, it makes uh, kind of the GPS and other signals more accurate. And then the Indian Regional Navigation Satellite System, IRNSS, and they're trying to change their acronym too uh, to NAVIC. So um, you'll see that listed as uh, two different ones. So this is your personal GNSSS guide in balloon format. Okay, let's hand out the balloons. Okay, so this is kind of a frivolous exercise, but if you go along with it in the fact that we really just wanted to try out these light up balloons, then you'll get the, get the point of the exercise. So um, Joshua, are you here? Could you please hand out the LED part portion? It's on the table. So please don't swallow the LED part when you're blowing up the balloons. <laughs> safety, safety discussion here. Um, I've actually not tried this yet. This is a, an open package of LEDs, but once I saw these, I couldn't resist. We have to do it, it's a dark room. How else are you gonna see to write on the balloon except if it's lit up, right? You're all with me, right? Yeah, right, right, yeah. right, right. Okay, exactly. <laughs> so. Yes, please, thank you. Okay, you have a black Sharpie. Please don't write on anything else but the balloon with the black Sharpie. Um, trust that you're all not seven years old. But. Okay, so the trick with the balloon is that, yeah, I see people doing it already. So before you blow it up, Go ahead and stretch it out a lot. It's easier to blow up if you stretch it. You know, if you've ever seen like a balloon creator, design creator, they always like really stretch it. And then when you blow it up, before you tie it, don't blow it up all the way. 
You just want it to be round like a globe. You don't want it to be that teardrop balloon shape. Is that helpful? Okay, and I'm gonna tr try one along with everybody. May I have a balloon, sir, please? Thank you. Yes. Okay. Oh, that's a perfect example. I don't have to blow it up, okay? <laughs> I'm just gonna borrow yours. <laughs> oh, and I'm so sorry. If anyone is allergic to latex, I have Mylar balloons for you. Oh, perfect, thank you. Alvaro, you're the best. Okay, so this is about the size that you want uh, for two reasons. One, so it's more like a globe. You know, our globes are a little bit, you know, not a perfect uh, round ball. Already, it's a little pointed at the at the poles, and um, when you ride on it, you don't want it to pop. So about this size is perfect. Nice. And in a perfect oh, in a perfect world, uh, instead of clouds, there would have been satellites. So just imagine that those clouds are satellites, and we'll all be okay. Okay, so in your perfect uh, envision of the continents, just go ahead and draw the continents on there. And you only get 15 seconds. I know. But not everybody has balloons. So the people in front get a little bit longer time. So higher expectations for the people in front on your uh, continent uh, drawings, continental drawings. And we do have prizes for the most beautiful and, you know, quickest and um, first pop in the room. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, you guys look so cool. Like, we need a shot of the crowd from this angle. Yeah. I don't know how we can get it. Once we get all the balloons lit, maybe for the song, we can all, like, dance along with the balloons. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, okay, thank you very much. Okay, and I've been requested to speak louder. And a lot of times, um, this has happened to me before, it's because I don't hold the microphone correctly or something and uh, get my voice in the side of the microphone. Okay, we almost have all the balloons all the way to the back. And I'm just checking the time here. But we're actually ahead of schedule here. You all are doing really, really well. It looks so cool with all the glittering balls. Thank you everyone for playing along. I really appreciate it. Okay, so here's our assignment for your own GNSS reference balloon. So you have about 30 seconds to draw the continents. And then you want to draw the four GNSS. So it's really hard to say this name because it's like, is it plural? Is it not plural? Is it plural? Is it not plural? So it's the four, and then it already has the word systems in it. So just draw the four GNSS. Uh, the first one is in the USA. The second one is GLONASS, that's in Russia. The third one is in Beidou in China. And the fourth one is in Galileo, and that's part of the song later. That's in Europe. And I did these little, um, they kind of look like butterflies. And actually satellites don't, they just have wings that go straight out. But like if you want to put a satellite in 
each of the countries uh, for extra credit, uh, that's cool. Okay, and then we have the two regional uh, GNSS, uh, the QZSS, and I still call it IRNSS, or NAVIC. And this is your first go through. So we're doing the first go through on the balloon, because I know the balloons will last about, you know, three minutes after this talk. And then you'll go ahead and uh, kind of repeat this process, but on the worksheet. Um, so you'll have the per a worksheet permanently. Um, did I just call it? I was trying not to call it a worksheet. It's your personal GNSS reference guide. Okay. Um, while people are finishing up in the back, we're going to uh, proceed on just a little bit in the slides. Did we run out? Another LED? Are we one LED short? Give them a ball, Cole. Give them, give them a prize. And so sorry, I will, I will make that right afterwards. Just give me your, give Cole your name. Oh, Joshua has a LED. Okay. Problem solved. Okay, while you all are working on that, I'm gonna drone on a little bit here. So GPS constellation arrangements, uh, they're typically about 24 satellites. They always have about 27 so that they can bring uh, the extra three online just in case uh, something goes wrong. Uh, but typically they're in uh, 24 satellite configurations. This is what the GPS uh, constellation arrangement looks like. Uh, so the only thing that you get from this slide that I want you to remember from this slide is it's a constellation. It's an artificial constellation. Now I'm going to show you a whole bunch of slides. You only need to remember one term. Satellite generations. Can you say that with me? Satellite generations. So I went down a huge rabbit hole because I wanted to get a picture of every single satellite generation <laughs> that was out there. And... Uh, uh, I kind of failed, but this is as far as I got, and I just wanted to share it with you. So the important part of this is that you want to keep in mind is that GPS 3F, these have special properties, and uh, they've been coming on uh, since 2021, and those are the ones that we want to start building around. Um, they have new, um, new faculties, new advantages that we wanted to take advantage of. Okay, uh, these are the generations, satellite generations of Russia. Uh, again, their newest generation has uh, special properties as well. Beidou satellite generations. Uh, I couldn't find a lot of pictures of those. These, in this illustration, uh, this happens to be incorrect. So... Um, these are actually, the illustration shows the GEO satellites, uh, and those are not the Middle Earth satellites. They're the GEO, um, thank you, thank you, someone said it in back, um, and I'll say it later when the slide says it, um, but uh, they're not the Middle Earth ones that we're, we can, we're concerned about. So I'll cover this more later, but the GNSS, uh, that we're talking about is in the Middle Earth orbit, orbits. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, the European ones. So it's really interesting. They never want to talk about, well, it's like they're, they're a whole separate category, the um, G-I-O-V-E. I think if you say that out loud, what is that? G-I-O-V-E? Yeah. Excellent. Yes, yes, that's exactly what it is. So, uh, so A and B, the only reason that they were launched was to claim the frequencies. So they really kind of weren't operational. They were just like, okay, we're here. We're, we're claiming the frequencies. So uh, a lot of times when people summarize, they don't even include those, but I really wanted to see what they looked like. So in the pictures uh, up in the corner here, you can see how they kind of differed from 
the ones in the bottom right uh, that are available today. So, um, so these are the ones that are operational. So not all of these 12 have launched uh, yet, uh, but are in the process of being launched in the next couple of years. Again, they have like uh, 24, uh, they have a constellation of 24. So um, the interesting thing is, even though they were late to the party, uh, they are more accurate, and you may want to leverage that when you develop your devices. So who run, like, I was like, wait, who's in charge of all this? You know, it's all these different uh, countries, you know, how, how do they not run into each other? You know, like, like, who does the coordination, all that kind of stuff. So uh, I didn't know there's United Nations Office for Outer, Outer Space Affairs. Kind of sounds like Men in Black, you know, like uh, association. But this is a subgroup of that. So if you ever see the acronym ICG, uh, that's the International Committee on GNSS. And they keep track of the cooperation between everybody. Oh, your personal GNSS guide. Time for the, time for the, the paperwork. Thank you. Okay, this one I recommend not writing on with that Sharpie that I just gave you, because it'll go right through the paper. If you don't have writing implements, we do have a few extra here. Uh, just uh, raise your hand if you do need one. Um, if not, you could try fold your uh, GNSS guide, but it will go straight through the paper onto the activity on the back too, so you kind of just want to work lightly. So this is when we go into the regional, how the regionals are different than the main GNSS. And I really appreciate you all playing along. You're, I heard um, Pat Dooley actually uh, talked to me yesterday and I said, yeah, I'm a little nervous. She said, no, but this is a warm and intelligent audience. And I was like, you're exactly right. That's exactly, exactly who we have here. <laughs> Josh, thank you for helping hand out the sheets. I really appreciate it. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and jump ahead. You all can catch up. Um, so we're gonna go over, uh, you're gonna fill in the same things that you filled in the balloon, so the four different systems. You fill in GPS, fill in GLONASS, Beidou, and Galileo. <laughs> okay, and then let me talk about the, while you're filling these in, let me talk about the regional systems. So, the regional systems are actually not in middle Earth orbit. They're actually higher up. And because of that, they travel along the equator and they're able to do kind of an elliptical orbit. So uh, it's kind of built on, I was trying to read more about this, but it's kind of built on three satellites. And um, somebody was raising their hand in the back, but Cole, Cole's getting it. They're getting a paper. Um, so there's three satellites. How can I do this without jumping too high? So let's imagine there's two satellites on this elliptical orbit. There's two satellites on that elliptical orbit. And then there's a satellite in the middle. So the two satellites on the elliptical orbit, I should have drawn this. Um, one is on the bottom end of that ellipsis, and one is on the top end of that ellipsis. And then a third one is in the middle of two ellipses. So that's kind of how it functions. It wasn't explained really well. Um, so that's as far as I've gotten with my understanding. Uh, if, if somebody else has a better understanding, I'd love to hear it after the talk. Um, so what this does is it reads the GPS signals or any of the other GNSS uh, constellations and feeds it back to those specific regions. So uh, for the QZSS, uh, it's for the Asian Pacific region and it's not uh, a perfect uh, ellipsis or ellipsis. I'm probably not using the wrong, I'm using the wrong word. The infinity symbol, 
Um, and uh, it's kind of bulbous down at the bottom. Um, so anyways, this is, we're kind of going off into the far reaches, but I did want to make you aware of those systems. Then there's a whole different category, SBAS, satellite-based augmentation systems. And these are, uh, I explain this a little bit better later because I like made up my own slide. I wasn't happy with this slide. Um, but uh, this reference, but this was this was really cool too. I really liked his reference station here. It goes to the master uplink station, communicates with the SBAS satellite, and then it communicates with your rover, uh, which is in this case the drone. So um, that's kind of how he portrayed it. And uh, it's a little bit different than RTK, but we're not going to go over RTK today. Uh, so what uh, satellite based augmentation systems uh, exist today. So when I first saw this reference, I was like, that's odd because I've only ever heard of, why do I have a picture in a picture? Okay, please ignore the picture on top of the picture, but I've only ever heard of uh, WAAS, WAS, or EGNOS, um, but I, and I had kind of heard of the one over Japan, um, the MSAS. So I was like, why hadn't I heard of this? So then I found this better graphic from Space Hubs Africa, which actually talks about which ones are operational already. So I don't know if you want to write these into your guide, but uh, you can write down the ones that are operational because you will see these acronyms in your spec sheets. You'll see them uh, detailed uh, when people talk about GNSS. And you just want to just be aware that they're there. Uh, you won't get tested on it, but uh, I just wanted to explain what they are. Okay, why don't they run into each other? Because they have different orbital altitudes. Uh, and I know it seems obvious once you know, but, you know, I was like, I, I just wanted to know how they were all coordinated. So in the middle Earth orbit, which is right here, this is a great graphic. Uh, it's from Wikipedia and... Um, CM Glee made it, uh, but it's used uh, like hundreds, maybe thousands of times. It's really great. I'm only using the top half um, so, so I can fit it onto the slide. But uh, you just want to keep in mind that we're in the middle Earth orbit for the GNSS. The Hubble, of course, is in the lower Earth orbit. And I'm really excited because a ton of satellite systems are coming on in the lower Earth orbit and may replace our 5G. Um, where do SBAS fit in? So here's another representation of that same idea. So we have the low Earth orbit, we have the middle Earth or orbit, and then we have the geo orbit, which is the farthest out and where the SBAS uh, satellite-based augment augmentation systems reside. Uh, so here's, uh, I just thought I'd throw this in. This is from Wikipedia. It's not up to date, but a far stretch of the imagination. There are many more systems here, but you may be interested in Global Star because if you have an iPhone 14, uh, you have the emergency services available now through uh, Global Star, and uh, they went bankrupt, came back to life, somebody bought the assets, and now Apple is using their satellites. Uh, for that um, system. So um, also Amazon is bringing on a new project. It's pronounced um, Kuiper, but it's pronounced, it's spelled K-U-I-P-E-R. So um, uh, yeah, uh, but they're coming on board and I'm excited about that project too because that is supposed to bridge the digital divide, uh, particularly in America where People don't have broadband at home. It's supposed to make broadband available for, for all. So, uh, GNSS frequency guide. So this is on the back of that paper. So up until now, all of our uh, tracking devices have been using L1, focused on the 1575, 0.42 frequency, uh, 
And we've mainly been using the civilian uh, signals, um, also the course acquisition signal. So the C uh, slash A is actually course acquisition. And it's not course as in like traveling course, but like course as in fame, uh, grains of sand. Thank you. So um, if you need to spell that out, and I should have spelled that out here. And it's important to note that L1 is the only signal that has the course acquisition uh, available. It does have civilian signals, and other ones have civilian signals, but it's the only one with the course acquisition signal. Okay, so L2 is also here, uh, but and it's been around for a long time, but uh, it's still being listed as incomplete. Um, but you can still build a system using it. The newest one, uh, it's been deployed in 2021. It was quietly deployed, um, but a lot of um, manufacturers have picked up on that. They've started making modules. You should find those modules out and about today. So if you want to make a device that is more accurate uh, at tracking, I recommend combining L1 and L5 and looking for those modules. And I was like, well, but what about L3 and L4? So uh, this is the explanation on that. So for uh, nuclear reasons, L3 and L4 um, ionospheric correction, but we don't hear much about those signals these days. Okay, GNSS signal frequencies. I purposely made some places blank on your worksheet. Your job is to fill those in. Ready, go. Okay, we have, you wanna focus on the upper L band because that's the one that all modules use. So let's go ahead and fill in the easy ones. A, R, N, S, R, N, S, S. They don't get discussed a lot. That's why they're in the top and we kind of breeze by them but they're there and they're down in the key below. So in the key below, please label GPS bands. They're in the yellow. And the GPS uh, frequency band here is the L1. That's the number one, the one that's not used number one, even throughout the world. So uh, just because GPS has been around since 1981, uh, it's the frequency that the rest of the world uses uh, up uh, still GLONASS bands. So keep in mind that your G1 GLONASS band over here is not contained around the, the L1 band here. So when you pick out your external components like your soft filter and your LNA, you want to make sure if you're going to include GLONASS, that it includes those frequencies as well. Galileo bands. And those, because uh, G was already taken, go by E. So the E1 band encompasses the L1 band. And then the Beido bands uh, are actually surrounding the L1 bands. And this is interesting because it's called the B1. And then I've seen most of the time it's called B1-2, but it can be called uh, other things as well. And when you're talking about frequencies, you want to focus on the 1575.42. Anytime you're you know, searching on DigiKey or whatever, that's, that's the frequency that you want to target. So... As I said before, 2021, uh, this band got added. So 1176.45. And I noticed there's a mistake in this uh, reference. And it's interesting because uh, I love this chart and I've used it for a very long time. Um, but I think they copied this, <laughs> they copied this mistake from, because I think it's based on uh, the one that's actually on Navipedia. So, um, Please go ahead and write this in uh, because this will be the next band that's coming alive soon. So it's the 122760 megahertz band. 
Okay, when you're finished writing, please raise your hand so I can get like a gauge of the room. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay, thank you. You can put your hands down. All right. Okay, are you ready for me to blow your minds? Yes. Okay, this is what it actually looks like. <laughs> so, um, so this is all that you wrote down just now is on uh, the upper L band side, this side right here. Uh, and these are actually uh, more accurate signal representations. So let me give you a close up of the one in the upper right hand corner. So uh, just to kind of break this down a little bit, these are the different signals that are actually within that band. So that's why it looks like that. Um, this is just a cursory look at uh, this format. Okay, you guys ready for GNSS 201? Yes! yes. Okay, great. How to track your dragon, GNSS 201. Okay, first of all, think of your target device. You can even write it down if you want. Are you tracking your kid? Are you tracking your spouse? Are you tracking your, uh, I don't know, runaway pet ferrets? Um, you need to ask yourself a couple questions. Okay, everybody have that in mind, what you're going to track? Okay. Does it need to be accurate? Say yes or no. Okay, does it need to be low powered? Say yes or no. Oh, nice. We got to know over there. <laughs> Do you care if it's expensive? Okay, whoops. Fast and dense areas? Okay, and does it leverage uh, like cellular, Wi Fi, LoRa? It could. Okay, excellent. So these will be important later. So the accuracy, um, so like tracking stolen cars, you want to know where that is. If you're landing an airplane, you want that to be kind of accurate. If you're birthing an ocean vessel, like up to the dock, you want, you want to know. So we're going to go over how differential GNSS works. This is called DGNSS sometimes. Uh, so basically... Uh, you use a ground station, uh, and then it gives you the differential information. You compare your differential information with uh, what your rover has received from uh, the sat its own satellite um, information, ephemeris data. And, uh, and so uh, you use those and you use those calculations to be able to create a more accurate uh, picture. So instead of 10 meters of accuracy, you're getting 10 up to 10 centimeters of accuracy. It's, it's quite good. Um, Satellite-based augmentation system works kind of similarly, except instead of a ground uh, reference station, you have a satellite-based reference system. Multi-GNSS, uh, just to break down the vocabulary here. So, this is when you have multiple systems. So you have Beidou, you have Galileo, you have GPS, and you're using all of that information to create a very accurate picture of where your rover is. That's the D-Track 400. Okay, the D-Track 5000 <laughs> is using the GPS L1 and L5. So same satellites, you're just using different frequencies from those satellites. Okay, do you need speed? Does it need to be fast? Uh, so for 911 calls, you definitely want those to be, uh, you wanna know exactly where that person is to help them. So uh, some things you can do to augment uh, your GNSS signal is to use Wi-Fi, LoRa, or cellular, uh, and use the computational power of that. And they can give you ephemeris data. This is great, especially if your rover is in between buildings or trees or just in spaces uh, where it's hard to get a signal to. Um, frequently, you can feed that signal to them so that they have the ephemeris and almanac data already calculated and already fixed uh, because sometimes when you're in these crowded areas, 
can take uh, more than 12 minutes to get a signal and your battery's gonna die. So uh, it's helpful to augment it. So timing, <gasps> it's the song time. It's time for the song because we all need a break, right? I need a break, you need a break, okay. Okay, so here's how the song goes. So who's ever been to camp? Has anyone ever sung like a camp song? Yep, yep. Okay, Joshua, I need you for this. Okay. Okay, do you mind coming up here with me? Okay, for those of you who may not know, I've been uh, had the pleasure of working with Joshua Wise for the last year. Uh, and um, would you like to say anything about yourself? No. Okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. He will be singing along with, if you're singing along with him, you're singing the Galileo portion. Okay, but first I'm gonna warm up the crowd, okay? So we're gonna start on this side. And um, if you could just, when I stand in front of your row, if you could just copy what I'm doing, okay? This is news to me, by the way. Yeah, okay, you ready? You know, GNSS, you know, Oh, wait, that's not sexy enough. Hold on. S bass. 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 S bass and Galileo. <laughs> we have to do the full thing. Is it? Yeah. The thing is that I don't know much. That, that's kind of the only thing that Galileo Figaro. That's all I have. <laughs> okay, that's. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. That's awesome. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Oh, wait, can you sing it? Get up here, get up here. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. I knew it would be the dry portion, so we need a little break. Okay, timing considerations, battery consumption. So you want to determine if you're checking in weekly, daily, hourly, every 15 minutes, if you're tracking a spouse, maybe every 30 seconds. So um, that's how my spouse checks me. <laughs> so I always forget to tell them where I'm going. Okay, so... Standby mode, low power mode, backup mode. These are all really valuable when you're talking about checking in. You have a cold start, a warm start, and a hot start. So it has to deal with if you already have the Almanac data already in your system. So those are different. And depending on the module that you have, they may have a slightly different definitions of uh, those particular statuses. So you want to work uh, with those for your timing considerations. Uh, so we had one module that it took them hmm, uh, over 12 minutes to get to the low power mode. <laughs> so it wasn't very low power in the end. Okay, cost. Uh, for battery powered devices, uh, I'm sorry, the battery powered devices is actually for the next slide. <laughs> It's a misspelling, but uh, cost considerations. Uh, some things to really keep in mind is that, especially for uh, boards with radio frequencies, you don't want to be short-sighted about spending money around that radio frequency trace. So those peripheral components, like the saw filter, like a notch filter, like um, uh, TVS diodes, all of those components, you'll be like, oh, I should just really take the one that's one penny less. But if you do an excellent job at designing your radio frequency signal, you can save dollars on the battery 
uh, in the end. And then it also decreases the size of your overall uh, tracking device as well. So um, don't scrimp on the, on the component costs on the radio frequency traced uh, for the GNSS in particular. So um, firmware development costs, uh, so even if the module is $2 less, but requires, you know, over $200,000 and eight months in firmware development, you may want to pass. It depends how long your device is going to be out there. If you're just making a prototype right now, you may want the solution that's just the easiest to bring aboard quickly. Um, PC fabrication costs, time and availability. Um, so the HDI uh, PCBs can take three days longer. Um, but as of November, a lot of fabricators, PCB fabricators, were um, making it free. It used to be a really exorbitant cost uh, to do like VN pads for small BGAs and things like that. But um, like, what was it? GLC PCB was the first one to just say, hey, it's free, everybody. So um, please take advantage of that. Uh, those use less chemicals when you have an HDI board uh, because it use, utilizes lasers. Uh, instead of um, exposing a PCB to an uh, image. So um, don't think I explained that well, but we're moving on. Unknown module vendors. So uh, in my search, uh, we did consider some generic modules, uh, but at the same time, you don't know if it's going to go out of stock. Uh, and also, um, your PCB fabricator can refuse the job. Sometimes they only wanted to uh, work with um, you know, approved vendors. So uh, that's something to think about. Supply chain, uh, module A is $2 less than module B, but isn't easily available in large quantities. So these are all considerations uh, to think about when you're thinking about cost. So uh, this is the battery powered devices part uh, for power consumption. So um, Really important thing to keep in mind, most uh, specification and data sheets for the modules list their power consumption in milliamps, but what they don't point out is what voltage that's at. So you really need to make sure that you do the math, uh, convert it to watts, and uh, compare all of your selections based on watt wattage. So um, if you do, don't do that, you'll get bit really hard. So uh, I gave some examples here, but, um, and then you wanna keep the time to first fix, that's what TTFF is. Um, so if the module takes a long while, and I already gave kind of this example, we had one that took over 12 minutes, um, time to first fix. And so you wanna calculate how much of your battery will be consumed. I walked through the math here. And then, uh, component selection besides the GNSS module. So this is the meat of it all, everybody. Um, so uh, this is the most heinous example. So this is if you're not using a module that may already have these elements in it, but you wanna, you wanna know about these elements so that even if you're picking out a module, you wanna go, oh, does it already have the LNA included? Does it already have the solid filter included? You know, those kinds of things. So uh, this is an inductor capacitor filter, um, CJ L-shaped um, that we put on uh, in the beginning. The soft filter is the surface acoustic uh, wave. I always want, want to make sure that I get that A right. Um, the low noise amplifier is also, uh, um, it boosts the signal once it's been filtered out. So you really want that in, because it's a really light signal, and you really want that boosted before you do all your calculations. The notch filter, um, so this can be used for many things. Um, one interesting thing is if you have LTE on your device as well, and it's an IoT module, it's probably transmitting in the 700 megahertz frequency. Unfortunately, for that 700 megahertz frequency, the second, um, sorry, I'm blanking on the word for it now, but harmonic. thank you, second harmonic, thank you very much. Alvaro, save me again. Um, so the second harmonic is actually at the 1575 
Being a drink is, is really unfortunate. So uh, you can sometimes notch it. Like if, if you're really precise, you can kind of notch it out. Um, that's uh, something you could use the notch filter for. Another thing you can do is just not run the GNSS while you're running the LTE transmission or reception. So uh, that's uh, just a consideration to think about. So not a lot of people know about that, um, and I probably should have documented that a little bit more here. I will in future, in the future. Um, matching Pi network, uh, you typically have that for a radio frequency. It's a capacitor inductor uh, kind of scenario, and the reason why it's called a Pi is it's usually in a Pi shape. So it has uh, the capacitors going this way. Uh, and then you may have capacitors coming down or uh, inductor, depending on how you have your setup. And then the ESC TVS is really important if you have a UFL attached, uh, like peel and stick antenna, and you're trying to test all these different peel and stick antennas, you want to make sure that what's it called, the human body shock, uh, there's a technical term for this, but you want to make sure that you don't fry your equipment and so you want to make sure to put the uh, ESD TBS diode on there as well. Sorry, that was a real rush through the overview, though. Thanks for hanging with me. And then, um, yeah, decide which frequencies you will target, uh, particularly your saw filter. OK, yeah, I already covered all that. Um, one just PS, by the way. <laughs> Uh, I learned that in the code, so for example, the original code that I was working with, everything was listed in GPS, even though we were starting to use other constellations. And so because of that, I wanted to change everything to GNSS, and I kept misspelling it. So to get around that, I noticed that there was another vendor that just used PS for positioning system. Uh, in all their firmware, I highly recommend adopting this, this uh, habit. Uh, so, uh, and you'll be able to adapt when the low Earth orbit uh, satellite systems uh, come in. So the GNSM modules that are available today, uh, the well-known ones are on the left. The lesser known ones are on the right. Uh, if anybody has uh, dealt with uh, the lesser known ones or ones I haven't even heard of, please let me know. I'd love to learn more. Uh, and uh, because you're all here today, I'll give you a tip. So Sony and Skyworks, I would highly recommend just checking those out. Um, you may not be able to afford them. They may not talk to you, but, <laughs> but uh, those are, and this is, I think this is it. Yeah, this is it. Thank you very much for your attention today. I really appreciate it. Do we have time for questions? Okay. Uh, so for questions, I can't run around with this wire mic, so if you want to uh, come up and line up over there, or actually it's over here, then uh, have anything questions. Or maybe better yet, I'll just, uh, you can just repeat the question. Okay, uh, that's perfect. Yeah. Let's do that. Okay, I'll be repeating the question. Uh, any questions? That was a lot of information. I can imagine if you don't have questions right now, but uh, I'm happy to take them if you have them. I'm curious about the non-disclosure agreement. So they typically have you know, the experience that most of these vendors want to uh, provide an NDA or? That's a good question. So the question is, uh, do most of the vendors want to sign an NDA? So um, typically, yes. Uh, but Nordics, a lot of Nordics information is online. So if you want to get started, I highly recommend uh, using a Nordic module uh, because just all the documentation is there and they're pretty easy to get. Yes. Um, you touched on lower orbit GNSS satellites. Um, how quickly do you think those will mature and become in wide use? And what's that's a really good question. So uh, the question was, um, you know, how fast will the evolution be to the lower Earth orbit satellites? Uh, and then will we lose uh, kind of our usage of the middle 
Earth orbit satellites. I think that we will always have the uh, Middle Earth orbit GNSS uh, because it, we've just had it so long. Uh, it'll probably be with us a ton longer. But as for the lower Earth orbit satellites, I think it'll take about five years to get those established. Uh, even, they're still kind of in the baby stage right now, but they are available. And the more systems we can build around them, I think uh, the sooner we can all uh, leap to that system. Yes? So you, your diagram that shows it's the L1 and the L5 satellite, did they put them up in orbit with the ability for updates and frequency? Yes, yes. And probably uh, that may also be the reason why they're, you know, um, the constellations are, I'm so sorry, I was trying to, I need to repeat the question. So the question was. Uh, L1 and L5, L5 came on later. Right. Same satellite. How the mechanics are getting that frequency? Right. So L1 and, uh, so L5 came on later. Oh, uh, yes. So um, the question was, how did they update the signal? So for example, uh, up to the L5 uh, signal uh, in later satellites. Uh, and the reason is that uh, I talked about that there's a 24 unit constellation, but they always have like three extra satellites. So I believe that they take you know, one satellite offline so they can update it and put, you know, substitute those three in and then up, update uh, the technology or the signals, uh, test them, all of those kinds of things. But uh, the shorter answer is that all of the last generation of satellites had those capabilities already built in. Uh, it's just making sure that they were all coordinated uh, once they got up there. Uh, was the big job, so. Yes. Uh, yeah, just a comment on the uh, your your well taken point about the component selection and how you get it to spend a little more. And not spend more. Another one to consider is the clock uh, source. That you need to have a temperature compensated crystal. Oh. That's a really good point. So uh, not a question, but a point, but uh, you really need to have a good clock signal uh, for your device that's being tracked. Uh, and so, and what is your name? Uh, Pete. Pete uh, brought up that it's good to have a temperature controlled um, crystal for that. So, and I'm sorry, that's the last question that we'll have, but I'll be available outside uh, after this. And thank you again for attending. I appreciate it.